Hey everyone, welcome to Organizations in International Law, and of course this is part of the first part, Organizations. So we're going to quickly just cover what are these in order to get moving to the more you know, hefty and meaty part of the international law part. But international institutions are, and organizations, whatever we use that those words often interchangeably, uh, are going to be an important part. One of the things people don't really get, and I'm going to start simply, is what are they? Well, let's just go for two. There's NGOs, non-governmental organizations, which are going to play a key role, but also international organizations. What's the difference? Well, there are two key differences. Obviously, one is part of the state, right? You have the United Nations. So the United Nations are made up of all these states, right? Everybody knows that here, so they're saying that's pretty easy. You have the IMF, though, the International Monetary Fund. Again, World Bank's representing quote unquote state interests. The reason why I differentiate between IGOs and NGOs, NGOs are also organizations that are beginning to exert more influence internationally, but are not supposed to have a political agenda. So what does that even mean? Doesn't everyone have a political agenda? Well, that could be the case in a lot of cases, but not always. Take Jimmy Carter. Who's Jimmy Carter? Jimmy Carter, he was the president of the United States, you know, great peanut farmer from Georgia. You know, after getting kicked out and Ronald Reagan took over, what do you do? Well, he actually became... <laughs> pretty good non-president. And he started not only Habitat for Humanity, but analyzing elections across the world. And he just wanted to see if they were fair and free. So I'll give you two cases that shows that he's not quote unquote bias and how institutions are. So Jimmy Carter would go around the world, developing countries, seeing these things. He went to Nicaragua where this young girl is, which we'll get to her in a minute, in 1990. And the Sandinistas were governing the country and the United States didn't like them and wanted them out. When they were quote unquote voted out, when we were holding illegal wars against them, which we're gonna talk about another time, he said the election within was free, the Sandinistas lost, that's it. So Daniel Ortega stepped down and uh, Dania became, Violeta Chamorra became president. Everyone loved Jimmy Carter, right? United States, the conservatives, the liberals. Ah, oh, this guy's great, right? He, he, he analyzes election. He sees what's going on. He knows what's going on. But he's independent. He goes, I don't care whether they win or lose. I'm just here to analyze the election. Just so he helped, you know, coax Daniel Ortega to step down. You know, I lost two, he said. It's the hardest thing. <laughs> you know, as another loser, I want you to say, I, can, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. So... Uh, everyone loved Jimmy Carter. Later, Jimmy Carter went to Venezuela, analyzed like 13 out of the, you know, 13 elections there. The recall of Hugo Chavez, for example, said, you know something, Hugo Chavez has been winning these elections fair and square. In fact, he won the recall in Venezuela. And this is the fairest election system I've ever seen. Everyone started saying, Jimmy Carter is crazy. Jimmy Carter is a nut. He's got peanuts for brains. I don't know what happened to that guy. He's an absolute nut. Everyone it went into electional denial. Do you know that term now with the tuning movement, all this stuff? Well, we've been doing it for years. So when Hugo Chavez won all these elections, you know, these Harvard, one Harvard professor's, uh, what is it, Carlos Hausman, Ricardo Hausman, sorry if I'm forgetting his name. Uh, he's Venezuelan, and uh, Moises Naim, who hates Hugo Chavez, they started getting into a big thing. Oh, this can't be true. And they started all this crazy electional denial stuff. And the United States of America, no, this can't be true. We tried to go in there and overthrow Hugo Chavez and all this stuff. And it's like, wait a minute. Who, Jimmy Carter is just doing what an NGO does. It's not playing a political game, right? 
it's basically saying, did he win the elections or not? And as an independent observer, I say yes. That's it. So what's the problem? That's the big difference between NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and international governmental organizations. All the international governmental organizations we're going to study, we're going to do the IMF, the World Bank, right? Um, we're going to read some stuff on regional organizations. We have ASEAN. Can it help deal with the Myanmar crisis? We have uh, we used to have, you're going to read something I've done, UNASUR, which is a regional organization that actually did good work. Uh, we, we have the OAS, or is it too dominated by the United States? That's the organization of the American states. But the, the big problem with international organizations we're going to see is, are they, do well, I'll, I'll posit the question, are they dominated by elite interests of the state itself. So the IMF, for example, goes to countries like back here in Nicaragua and say, oh, you need to privatize things. And then when they privatize things, I wrote a paper on this, all these companies from the richer countries jump on it and buy it all up. And not just like, you know, gringos, I'm talking France, Mexico, Carlos Slim, uh, and other things. So are they pushing policies to help the people or are they pushing policies to help themselves? We have the United Nations, which can be a great institution, right? The United Nation gives everyone a voice, which I think is good. A lot of people say, oh, I don't like a government. They shouldn't have a voice. Well, that's what the United <laughs> Nations is about. So this is going to be one of the things that's very, very important. And one of the debates, you know, is the United Nations fair to Israel, right? Should states get involved or international organizations in the Myanmar crisis? You know, what are the good and bad of international organizations? There is no good and bad. It's, it's very, very nebulous. On the one hand, the United Nations does great work. It, it, it helps with refugee uh, support. I mean, look at all the people, all the refugees out there that would not have homes if it weren't for the United Nations. We're going to see a video on that. Um, it does help a lot of children. I remember when I was working in Nicaragua, a lot of people worked for the United Nations. I did contract work helping uh, the employees through English, translation, and other things. And they were doing great work with the food program. And so they do do good work. The pro and they do do try to help children. This is a girl. She's selling agua in the street with a McDonald's cup. Isn't that weird? You know, it's like a McDonald's cup. She's drinking, uh, you know, American expansionism. But look at like she's selling little bags of agua. The United Nations came out a long, long time ago and said, we need to stop this child from working. Not this particular child, but, you know, child at work because it's considered exploitation. They realized big mistake. Why? Isn't that good to get kids like her off the street so they can go to school, right? Grow a good normal life. They realized it was quite ethnocentric and wealth-centric because then that threw some families into poverty. And they said, well, this is much worse. So then they said, no, we're going to regulate child work in a lot of these countries because a lot of families have no other choice. It's okay for their kids to maybe sell things in the street, et cetera. Uh, work at the local poporia, that's a local store in Nicaragua. I won't, we won't be only doing, <laughs> I talk about Nicaragua because I live there. We're going to be talking all the four corners of the world, right? You know, is it, you know, so they began to understand this and said, we're going to re regulate people like this in the street. It's not good but it's a reality that some families need to have. And that kind of space is good that the United Nations admitted, wow, we're wrong. We're thinking from a pure US perspective when maybe we have to understand how other people live. So some organizations do good work, right? Uh, but, and they have good intentions. The ICC, International Criminal Court, great institution, put away those war criminals. 
United States won't be part of it. Um, you know, uh, we're saying Putin is a war criminal. How many people in the United States has committed illegal wars? I mean, Richard Nixon, Vietnam, Cambodia, literally said, if it flies, bomb it. I mean, we've invaded just about every country illegally. Um, Nicaragua, for example, in the 1980s, we had um, an illegal war against them. And you're going to read the case when we get to it. And the Nicaraguan uh, government took us to the International Court of Justice in 1980, I'd say about uh, the early 1980s. And by the, I think around 1984, 85, when you read the case, you'll see they came to the conclusion through a certain process that the United States was found guilty of illegal intervention, you know, illegally uh, arming the Contras. Uh, we could go on and on. And the United States was so powerful, right? It said, we don't care. So then people say, see, the international system doesn't work. In another case, right, Argentina took Ghana to court because Ghana was holding its military ship because Argentina owed a lot of money to these vulture funds and the vulture funds, that is banks in the United States that bought up bad loans from Argentina kind of like the mafia does. And Ghana held its ship because, to, you know, the United States has held its ship and don't let it out until they pay us, right? Typical mafia. And Ghana said, okay. But then Argentina took it to the International Court of the Sea and won. And Ghana said, well, they won the court case and they let it out. Wait a minute. If, 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 if international institutions don't work, right? And what, why are you going to do that? Well, it did it because states, particularly smaller states, do listen to these international institutions and law. And it's very, very important to them. And that's something we don't think about that, you know, we're not a U.S. centric world. This class is not called the United States. Although it should be, right? No, we can't be uh, U.S. centric. So we have to expand them. I say, well, how are other countries seeing international institutions? And I notice, despite the horrors sometimes of the United Nations, um, if you see that movie, I always oh, always slips my mind. But um, the one, uh, I always say the Notebook, and people say, wait a minute, that's about the people of the old couple that <laughs> have Alzheimer's. I think, yeah, I think I do have Alzheimer's. But um, it's based on a movie, The Whistleblower, where United Nations officials were actually involved with like trafficking of women in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There's been cases of literally rape uh, uh, by United Nations employees. So it's been horrible for uh, a lot of uh, situations. But by and large, these institutions have a good reputation in many countries for doing good uh, work, particularly Latin America. Uh, Africa sometimes is a different story. Uh, they see them as dominated a lot of institutes by France. That's what we're going to get into as well. Can these institutions be modified? Uh, one of the things that we're going to ask is, is the United Nations a worthy institution? You know, get it. We're going to have a debate on that. Uh, and what kind of changes that needs Security Council kind of dominated by those five players. Um, so this is something we need to start talking about with international institutions. And that's why we begin before we get into the meaty part, because we have to understand the organizations themselves. I mean, you know, this isn't going to be like a history class, what's the history of the United Nations, where did it develop, et cetera. But we have to understand the certain interests in these institutions. So if the United States is so immature and can't even admit when a government gets democratically elected, it doesn't like and be like CUNIN, then how can international institutions work? And the question begins, can we have alternative international institutions that 
kind of marginalize these hegemonic powers. Now, it's not just the U.S. It's not like, oh, this guy's against the United States. I think I'm more against hegemonic powers because when you start seeing the Philippines, Right. They're saying, you know, the the you know, look at the encroachment of China in the South Chinese Sea. This scares a lot of people. The Vietnamese do not like, according to survey data, like the United States who bomb the living crap out of them more than they do the Chinese because the Chinese is a hegemonic power, you know, in their neighborhood. So now they're looking for the United States to kind of balance. In fact, Barack Hussein Obama, one of his best policies was to lift the ban on giving weapons to Vietnam in order to balance, you know, help balance China. So I think, you know, a lot of institutions are dominated by hegemons or powers and powers just want to dominate. So can institutions create a fairness in the world? This can be tough because when you see places like the, um, as I'll say in another lecture, the International Monetary Fund, right? The IMF, you know, a lot of their policies are not written by the poor people. They're written by the rich. In fact, I published an article on the IMF and the World Bank, and they called my house in Nicaragua. This was years ago and said, you don't have the right to publish because it was in a local newspaper. And I'm like, what am I going to be whacked by the IMF? And they're like, the guy was screaming at me. Like I said, well, the IMF's not very popular. He's like, I know it's not popular and stuff. like. So are they even democratic? And, and there is no yes or no. It's a very nebulous thing. It depends on the policy. It depends. But some institutions can open up that space for debate, for things like when Che Guevara gave that, you know, a big speech at the United Nations, love of Che Guevara is very relevant, um, you know, really rallied up other people, right? So, you know, gave them the space that uh, as a winning revolutionary, although he wasn't much of a fighter um, and his vocal theory wasn't the best, but um, essentially, you know, he, 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 he gave him space. It gives people space. It gives Bolsonaro space. Uh, he's not in power anymore, but, you know, give Trump space. It gave Gaddafi space. It gives people you like and ha hate space to speak. And this way we can actually understand what people are thinking, whether we love them or hate them. And people always say, well, they're lying or they're doing this or they're doing that. And, um, this is very important. And one of the interesting things about the international, because I was about to sneeze, I'm like, oh no, I'm in a lecture. Hey, it reminds me, the who. I never spoke about the who. And I'm not talking about the band. I'm talking about the World Health Organization until the COVID. So like all interesting about institutions as well, we have a debate about is that sometimes there's an inexplicable arbitrary event, obviously I'm referring to the COVID that just boom, explodes and it brings this institution to the forefront. No one was talking now being a little older than you, you people were born before the COVID, I, I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, no one talked about the who. It was like, if I ever had a debate, should we use the who? They're like, what the hell are you talking? You know what I mean? It's like now, you know, obviously it's Fauci and all this stuff. And the who was the who on China's side was the who, you know, uh, influenced by China. All these different things. And and I don't think it's like China's an evil power or anything like that. that I mean, I'm not trying to create Chinese phobia. But, you know, China has interest. It doesn't want anyone to probably know that, you know, the COVID came from them, right? Just like the United States wouldn't want anyone to know the COVID came from them, right? So, like, did it have influence over the, right? Just like the United States has influence over the United Nations. It uh, illegally supports a war in Nicaragua. Nicaragua takes it to the International Court of Justice, wins, and the United States says, I don't care. So, I mean, is China like doing the same with the, with the who, right? Or trying to cover it up a bit? I don't know. That's going to be what you people are going to say, right? Or did the who, regardless of China's influence, just do a poor job? Was it all over the place? And that's one of the debates. The who did or did not do a good job with the, uh, with the pandemic. And that's a very important debate because that puts a role of international 
organizations to the forefront of analysis. And that arbitrary event or not arbitrary, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a, a disease specialist here. Um, although I almost died of dengue hemorragico. So I guess I should be. Uh, but you know, regardless, what do you think are these organizations useful? Right. And for me, it's it's not that easy to say yes or no. There's this kind of hybrid mentality where it depends on the policy and it depends on the learning. And that is the point of this background. You know, they learn, wait a minute, we're imposing uh, wealthier standards to these countries and we can't do that. So now we have to figure out something else. If institutions can do that and, and be kind of learning oriented, then they can do things, right? So there's so many institutions that we could talk about. Obviously, European Union is going to be a big one, um, among others, and it's going to be a, a, a great class. But there's a second part I wanted to talk about. What's the difference between non-governmental organizations and international organizations? Well, it goes without saying non-governmental organizations like Amnesty International, et cetera, don't have that much money. And I'm going to send, I'm going to put some uh, cool kind of just supplement if you're interested in some non-governmental organizations. They do great work. I worked with one that was helping in Colombia with the priest process. And they were basically, you know, they're a non-governmental organization. They've gotten money from a lot of places. Um, they gotten threats broken into by right-wingers who hate the peace process after the 60-year uh, uh, civil war in Colombia. But um, the, the, it's called the, um, the name's always difficult for me to pronounce, but uh, Nuevo Arcos Iris, the new... Um, the new rainbow company, something like that. So uh, they do good work. Um, and I'm very proud to have known the guy who uh, spearheaded the project and hang out with him. I haven't been down since the COVID. Uh, Columbia has not been uh, very safe. But the point is they've done great work at helping kind of incorporate the ex-combatants. And that's what you're going to see. A lot of... Um, organizations will do smaller things that big organizations like the World Bank and IMF forget. And that's what we're going to see with the video of the Grameen Bank. A lot of people don't know about the Grameen Bank and how it took off in Bangladesh. Then the guy became a little political. And all that. But regardless, one of the points of that video I want you to understand when you watch the Grameen Bank, it's a little propagandistic because it's from them, right? Uh, but think about it. What are they trying to do in that video, right? How is it so small? But why would you think an international institution like the World Bank, like the IMF, would not do something like the Grameen bank would do because they're focusing on way bigger projects right they're focusing on way bigger projects so like you know no one's thinking about these poor little women and others who might need low interest loans so that's the role i mean it's a it's a beautiful story uh and it became very famous right Obviously, it's more capitalistic, so you know, lending people money and stuff, so it became popular. But micro lending became huge because of that NGO, the Grameen Bank, and I think that um, it was absolutely amazing that um, you know how some NGOs, as we're going to see throughout this course, have actually because it says you know international organization, the big picture, but a lot of NGOs are doing great work on the ground that international organizations are failing to do. But international organizations love them. I hate them. are doing things that other institutions can't do because they simply don't have the funding and the experience and the background. One, let me tell you, after the Colombian peace process, everyone has a gun. When you lay down your arms, who's going to collect them? Who's going to be involved in all this? That was the United Nations. United Nations stepped in, right, to help collect all the arms of the FARC. The FARC 
EP were the guerrilla group that were battling the government for like over 60 years. So without the United Nations, right, probably peace would have happened. Maybe because we see cell-south relations, which you're going to write about. But you need that entity in order to kind of help secure this peace. So you see the goodness of these international organizations, but there's a lot of weaknesses because they're very, very self-interested. You know, the World Bank and IMF, they don't go in and say, man, we really help love you. They didn't love me when they wrote to me. They were screaming at me. So, you know, they are very self-interested. And remember, we're not going to limit it. It's not limited to say, hey, the United Nations. Let's just talk about that. Oh, the who? That popped up because of the COVID. Or, nor just, you know, um, the European Union, which we're going to talk about because it's very important. I actually gave the European Union class a while back. Um, NATO is an international institution. It's a defense institution. Right, regardless of what you want to call it, that's what it is. It's a member states made up of states in order at in the beginning to balance the Soviet Union. Why did it last beyond the Cold War? Is it because of elite power? That's going to be a theory that that's been out there because it helped the well, it didn't help because we lost Afghanistan, but it in the beginning it pushed out the Taliban, right? NATO was involved in Afghanistan. NATO was also involved in the bombing of the former Yugoslavia, getting rid of Gaddafi, which was now Africa is a failed, I mean, uh, Libya is a failed state and it helped destabilize other parts of Africa. But it's still, regardless, an international institution, NATO. So, you know, when you start thinking about, hey, what am I going to do my paper on some kind of international law case? Or, you know, NATO as a defense, now it's being used for what? The Ukraine crisis. So this is one of the things, you know, that's another question or debate you could choose. You only choose one debate. So it's pretty interesting how all these institutions, I mean, I could talk forever and you're like, please don't, please don't. But that's the crux of this class, right? I mean, it's like, okay, we're going to study institutions, but institutions just not the United Nations, you know. What about Africa? And what about all these others? What about, you know, um, China trying to create other institutions, you know, different banks in order to balance the World Bank. BRICS is BRICS, an alternative to other organizations who would like to be, right? Now we get into the IMF that has sustained the power of the dollar. In fact, that was one of the, the goals of the IMF was to solidify a currency but the United Nations was obviously obvious one hooked the uh, United Nations, uh, the, the United Nations, the United States dollar to the to the um, gold standard and then everyone else's currency to us to keep a stable currency to keep trade flowing. So it helped solidify the dollar. Now there's other institutions coming up challenging that. So very interesting about institutions, not just about oh, the IMF, the World Bank. You know, now there's what makes this class so interesting. Now there are just so many institutions out there. Um, and I'll leave you there before I hit you with too much. But um, we're going to watch some other videos that aren't mine and stuff. But uh, thanks for taking the class. There's about 200 people on it. but um, And I hope you enjoy it. Take care, everyone. And if you have any questions, if you've taken me before, you probably know. <laughs> Drop it in community forum so everyone can see. Take care.